Welcome to Lost in Revision. All of our content is public domain fairy tales and folklore. We are here to celebrate the original literature instead of just reading the modern sanitized versions. We post short segments of stories daily for people who just want a story to follow along with and monthly full episodes where we read and discuss popular classics. Come and find us on Patreon to listen to the full chapters early and without interruption. Any support you can offer helps keep this podcast going and you entertained. All of our music is by Nathan Hubble and is used with his permission. Thanks and enjoy the show. Chapter 3 The Old Gentleman Part 1 After the adventure of Peter's coal mine, it seemed well to the children to keep away from the station. But they did not, they could not, keep away from the railway. They had lived all their lives in a street where cabs and omnibuses rumbled by at all hours, and the carts of butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, I never saw a candlestick maker's cart, did you? Might occur at any moment. Here in the deep silence of the sleeping country, the only things that went by were the trains. They seemed to be all that was left to link the children to the old life that had once been theirs, straight down the hill in front of the three chimneys. The daily passage of their six feet began to mark a path across the crisp, short turf. They began to know the hours when certain trains passed, and they gave names to them. The 915 up was called the Green Dragon. The 107 down was the Worm of Wantley. The Midnight Town Express, whose shrieking rush they sometimes woke from their dreams to hear, was the fearsome fly-by-night. Peter got up once, in chill starshine, and peeping at it through his curtains, named it on the spot. It was by the Green Dragon that the old gentleman traveled. He was a very nice-looking old gentleman, and he looked as if he were nice, too, which is not all the same thing. He had a fresh-colored, clean-shaven face and white hair, and he wore rather odd-shaped collars and a top hat that wasn't exactly the same kind as other people's. Of course, the children didn't see all this at first. In fact, the first thing they noticed about the old gentleman was his hand. It was one morning as they sat on the fence waiting for the Green Dragon, which was three and a quarter minutes late by Peter's Waterbury watch that he had given him on his last birthday. "'The Green Dragon's going where Father is,' said Phyllis. "'If it were a really real dragon, we could stop it and ask it to take our love to Father.' "'Dragons don't carry people's love,' said Peter. "'They'd be above it.' "'Yes, they do, if you tame them thoroughly first. "'They fetch and carry like pet spaniels,' said Phyllis, "'and feed out of your hand. "'I wonder why Father never writes to us.' "'Mother says he's been too busy,' said Bobby. "'But he'll write soon,' she says. "'I say,' Phyllis suggested, "'let's all wave to the green dragon as it goes by. "'If it's a magic dragon, it'll understand and take our loves to Father.' And if it isn't, three waves aren't much. We shall never miss them. So when the green dragon tore shrieking out of the mouth of its dark lair, which was the tunnel, all three children stood on the railing and waved their pocket handkerchiefs without stopping to think whether they were clean handkerchiefs or the reverse. They were, as a matter of fact, very much the reverse. And out of a first-class carriage, a hand waved back. A quite clean hand. It held a newspaper. It was the old gentleman's hand. After this, it became the custom for waves to be exchanged between the children and the 915. And the children, especially the girls, liked to think that perhaps the old gentleman knew father and would meet him in business, wherever that shady retreat might be, and tell him how his three children stood on a rail far away in the green country and waved their love to him every morning, wet or fine. For they were now able to go out in all sorts of weather such as they would never have been allowed to go out in when they lived in their villa house. This was Aunt Emma's doing and the children felt more and more that they had not been quite fair to this unattractive aunt, when they found how useful were the long gaiters and waterproof coats that they had laughed at her for buying them. Mother, all this time, was very busy with her writing. She used to send off a good many long blue envelopes with stories in them, and large envelopes of different sizes and colors used to come to her. Sometimes she would sigh when she opened them and say, ah, Another story come home to roost. Oh, dear, oh, dear and then the children will be very sorry. But sometimes she would wave the envelope in the air and say, Hooray! Hooray! Here's a sensible editor. He's taken my story, and this is the proof of it. At first the children thought the proof meant the letter the sensible editor had written, but they presently got to know that the proof was long slips of paper with the story printed on them. Whenever an editor was sensible, there were buns for tea. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank all of our supporters on Patreon. Your support helps pay for all of the things that podcasting requires and helps keep this show alive and growing. 
Feel free to fact check us and offer suggestions to make our show better for you. You can send us an email at lostinrevisionpodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow and give us a good review anywhere you listen and share with your friends and family. There's a lot more waiting for us all at the end of the road.